From topic 15, thermal dynamics, we saw this expression. The Gibbs free energy is equal to the enthalpy change minus the temperature in Kelvin times the change in entropy. And you can recall that if you want a spontaneous reaction, there were two things that a reaction had to have in its favor. One was we wanted it to change an enthalpy to be a negative value. We want this reaction to lose energy. And at the same time, we wanted its entropy to be a positive value. We wanted the spread of energy to be increasing as time went on. If we had both of these things in our favor, we knew the reaction was always going to be spontaneous. In this program, we want to look at a connection that exists between Gibbs free energy, this value, and the equilibrium constant. Another way of expressing Gibbs free energy is to look at products minus reactants. So in a situation where delta G is a negative value, that would mean that this value would have to be greater than this value. That's what I'm showing here on this diagram. So over here, we're plotting Gibbs free energy with my reactants having more energy, Gibbs free energy, than my products. And here, showing the progress of the reaction as we go from products towards reactants. Now, in this particular situation, as my reaction begins, I have only reactants present. Once the reaction starts, I now have a mixture of products and reactants. The Gibbs free energy starts to drop in my system, and it continues to drop as I proceed towards products, reaching eventually some minimum value. If you start with a container that's filled with products, we also know that the, react, that the products will proceed to make some reactants. And so from this end, we move in this direction. Eventually reaching this point right here. At this point, the Gibbs free energy is equal to some minimum value that actually lies less than the Gibbs free energy of the products and the reactants itself. At this minimum, we have this ratio of products over reactants. I can see that being closer to the product side, my p-value will be bigger than my reactant value. We can recall that this represents the equilibrium constant. So here, my equilibrium constant would be greater than 1. Let's consider the converse situation. If we have a situation where the Gibbs free energy is positive, that would only happen if this value was bigger than this value. So in this situation, what we've got to do is move the positions of these. So my reactants have to start at a lower position, and my products start up here at a higher position. So here, as my reaction starts to go, I very quickly reach a minimum Gibbs free energy. So G reaches a minimum fairly quickly. Here, from products, the reaction is going to proceed for quite some time until I reach that minimum down here. And at this point, I can see that the reactants in this situation are far, far greater than my products. So the equilibrium expression, product over a large amount of reactants, is going to give me a k value of less than 1. So what you need to understand here is that as we proceed from reactants to products or products to reactants, we want to obtain a minimum amount of Gibbs free energy. And that will occur at different places along this axis as the reaction proceeds. If delta G is a positive value, it tends to favor the reactant side. If delta G is a negative value, it tends to favor our product side. Here's the equation that appears for ch chapter 17 in your books. And here it relates the Gibbs free energy to the equilibrium constant. 
Now a little bit about the units that are in this. R we can recall from the gas constant is 8.314 joules per mole per Kelvin. T is our temperature in the Kelvin scale. This is the natural log of the equilibrium constant. And to use this expression, Gibbs free energy must be in joules in order for this to work. So make sure you convert your kilojoules, which typically you get delta G in, into joules to put it into this expression. So to summarize again, if delta G is a negative value, what that then tells me, in order to equal this side over here, this must have a positive value because of that negative sign there. So for delta G to be a negative value, for this to be negative, this must be positive. That would only happen if the ln of k was positive. Positive lons, positive natural logs, only happen if k is greater than 1. So you must have products greater than reactants. Conversely, if we look at the last case, if delta G is positive, that would only happen if this quantity was negative, because then you would have a negative times a negative. In order for the ln of k to be a negative, k must be less than 1, suggesting very small amount of products in most of the reactants. And finally, if delta G is equal to 0, ln k must equal 0. And that only happens when the equilibrium constant is about 1. So there's the use of that expression and how it maps between delta G and K. Negative delta G, spontaneous reactions, have K values bigger than 1. Non-spontaneous reactions have K values that are less than 1. Let's use this now in a little bit of a, a problem type. So calculate the equilibrium constant for this reaction, H2O liquid turning into H2O gas at 298. All right, the first thing we're going to do is calculate what's that value. And to do that, we need delta H minus T delta S. So putting in my values, um, now again, I'm going to want this in joules. As you can recall up here to work, it works best if I do that. So I'm going to take that 44 kilojoules and multiply it by 1,000. So that represents my delta H term minus T and times my change in entropy. And when I solve this, I get about 8,800 joules and I get a positive value for it. So that's going to suggest to me, because delta G is positive, this reaction is not spontaneous I would expect an equilibrium constant of less than um, 1. All right, now our expression, delta G is minus RT, the natural log of the equilibrium constant. Now I'm going to um, isolate for the ln of Kc, so minus RT, divide both sides. I can now rewrite this as KC equaling E raised to the exponent delta G over minus RT. So let's find out what that then would become. So I would then have E positive 88 thousand R 8.31 and my temperature um, 298 and that's negative in front of the uh, R value and that equals my equilibrium constant and when you solve using um, E in your calculators you're going to get an equilibrium constant of point 0, 2, 9. Now, that is consistent with the idea that we thought the reaction was not going to be spontaneous. Does liquid turn into gas spontaneously at room temperature? Well, if your container was a closed container, 
and you were to put water vapor into it, uh, water liquid into it, sure, some of it would turn into vapor. But when you reach equilibrium, most of it would remain as the liquid because you're still well below the boiling point of water. So this answer makes some sense to us. That concludes our series on equilibrium, and in the next unit we'll take a closer look at assets and bases. Thanks for watching.